Hey, it's Liz D'Alto, and this is the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. From body image, sex, spirituality, money and relationships, to motherhood, creativity, business, communication, and desire, Untame the Wild Soul Woman is the place to come for real stories and powerful advice to help you reclaim and redefine womanhood in the 21st century. What's up, wild ones? Real quick before we dive into today's episode, updating you on official dates set for the second Untame Yourself weekend retreat of 2016. Those dates will be July 28th to 30th, and it's here in sunny San Diego. So if you are interested in attending our April retreat, which we still have a couple spots for, that's April 29th to May 1st, also here in San Diego, or our July retreat, again, that was the 28th to the 30th, you can apply at untameyourself.com forward slash weekend dash retreat. And in case you haven't heard me mention it before, the reason why we do these intimate weekend retreats in an application process, and there's no page on the website to check out details or anything like that, is because I take a lot of pride in curating these groups to be groups of women that are going to come together and have an incredibly healing, transformative, and supportive experience. So I love to connect with you beforehand, make sure that it's a great fit for you, but also a great fit for the group that I'm gathering and for the goals, the dreams, the healing, and the transformation that we look to achieve and accomplish together on these weekends. So again, if you want to come to a retreat this year, you can apply at untameyourself.com forward slash weekend dash retreat. And on to today's show. Elizabeth D'Alto here, your host for the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. This is the first official interview I'm recording in my new home today. So excited and it feels so appropriate to have our guest with us, Neil Moore. Neil, I'm going to let Neil uh, introduce himself and tell tell you all about him because he does so many wonderful, amazing things. This is a very dynamic man. I'm so pumped mm. to have on the show today. I sat next to Neil at an event in January of 2015. And I remember, I don't remember who it was or why, someone had us, you know, pick a partner and like gaze into the person's eyes for a couple of seconds. And Neil was my partner. And I'm pretty sure I looked in your eyes and just started crying. <laughs> Cause you're, so, yeah, you're such a wonderful, deep, like very, very, very loving, super wise person. So thank you so much for saying yes. Oh, absolutely my pleasure, Elizabeth. Thank you, darling. Great to be here. Um, so the first question everyone gets asked, mm -hmm. what do you love about being a man? Mm. I love my femininity. Yeah, I love, uh, I love the male expression of tenderness. Ooh. I love uh, the male expression of affection. The male expression of intimacy, of closeness. Uh, I love that men are really just boys that got older, you know. I love that I get the privilege of being married to an extraordinary woman. And uh, I love that I get to be a man at a time when we're seeing, uh, like never before, a, a world of extraordinary, powerful women that are shaping the future of the planet. Yeah. I consider myself to be a lucky guy to be a part of and a witness to uh, a, a revolution. Yeah, it feels like that. a revolution. Mm -hmm. I love that I get to be a father to three extraordinary children. Yeah, there's some of the things. Ah, oh, you love you love your life, huh? I love my life. I love the great stuff, and I love the challenging stuff. And uh, I've got a pretty much a, a, a good balance of things that go really great and things that go really not great. And uh, and I, I I love it all. Cool. I like to to develop the practice of appreciation. So we're going to come back to many points that you just made. <clears throat> But okay. first, I'd love for you to share, I don't ever ask the question, what do you do? Because we all do so many things. Yes. Yeah. Um, what, what are, I feel like you're someone who contributes so much to the world. So we'll ask, ask it this way. What are the top three things right now that you contribute to the world that you are most passionate about? Mm. Well, I love the way you phrased the question. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about what I do. Sure. I, uh, 
I'm a, a, a pianist and a composer, and but I have a particular way of looking at music that's different than uh, anybody that I've met. I, I well, from a very very young age, I hear music and I see two and three dimensional shapes, and uh, I developed my even though I studied uh, piano from the age of seven. I'm uh, 58 now, uh, so I've been you know the piano's been an intimate part of my life for the last 50 plus years. Uh, from a very young age. I discovered that I have this relationship with hearing music, seeing these shapes. And as an adult, I discovered that I have a way of communicating what I see uh, to other people in a way that allows them to see music as I do. And in, that, uh, in, in, in acquiring that lens, that way of looking at music so differently, it completely transforms the experience and the speed and the process of learning. And uh, over a period of 20 years, I have developed that into an entire educational philosophy and educational methodology. And primar primarily, my organization trains educators to teach uh, my system, my program. And uh, I have educators uh, you know, around the world. We have about 800 locations around the world. And I've had uh, the, you know, the privilege of being able to contribute music and musical self-expression to just hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And it's a really, really awesome thing. And uh, it's, in the last few years, it's, it's really afforded me the opportunity to explore more social, entrepreneurial, philanthropy, sort of a blend of those things. And so I get an opportunity to be involved in projects that are big impact opportunities and uh, have an opportunity to not only work with mainstream education but uh, also work uh, in uh, smaller niche uh, challenged areas like you know, working with, uh, in the arena of brain deterioration, for example, or uh, in the special needs arena. And uh, we have some pretty exciting projects uh, that we're working on in that area as well. It's so it's cool. For the most part, that's my life, yeah. Creativity, I think it has so <clears throat> much, so much overlooked healing potential. So I mm. love to hear. And what, what is the name of that if anyone wants to look into it? Simply Music. Cool. Simplymusic.com. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I also, I love, and, and I know we've been on, in, in the community we're part of Archangel, we do these amazing choir storm calls. And mm. you, you actually came on with your beautiful wife, Hunter. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> you just have so much to share about relationship because if I remember mm. correctly, have you been together since you were 12? Yeah, Hunter had just turned 12 and I had just turned 13. <laughs> and uh, actually, I mean, I remember the moment that I met her, November the 21st, 1972 p.m., boom. And uh, I actually felt like I'd come home. And, uh, I mean, it's an interesting thing because, you know, I, I meet a lot of people and uh, I'm around constantly around a lot of great people, big hearted, big social consciences, big contributions. But, you know, when I'm around Hunter, I, I am more myself, most myself, most uh, honored and most privileged uh, when I'm around my buddy. Yeah. So uh, today's 16,511. <laughs> so many days you've known each other? Yeah. Ah, yep. That's amazing that you keep yeah. that count. So yeah. um, in the beginning when I asked what you love about being a man, you said something about the male expression of intimacy. Yeah. Can you riff on that a bit? What does that mean to you and what does that look like for you? Well, I, I really could only speak you know, for me and, and through me and uh, you know, that uh, I don't know that I can speak for other guys. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Certainly, from my point of view, I think you know by design, I'm I'm an affectionate person. I mean, my my uh, ground zero, my starting place when I meet somebody is that I'm going to come from, I love you, and uh, unless there's some compelling reason for me to feel otherwise, uh, that's you know pretty much where I come from. And the way that I like to express that, I like to express that both with uh, personal as well as physical intimacy. I'm a hugger, you know. I uh, I go into my office and hug every one of my one of my team, and you know that's just how I am. And I, I love the ability uh, to to communicate and interact people with people closely. It's interesting because, well, I don't know. It's interesting. It's sort of interesting to me that a lot of my time is spent where I'm in communication with groups of people, or maybe I'm at some event or speaking at some event. But really, I'm a pretty shy person in many respects, and I, I'm not. In some respects, I'm not really that social a person. I like. I would much rather sit down and have an intimate conversation with someone 
than uh, mingle in a large group of people. I'm not particularly good at small talk, but if I'm going to ask you, how are you and how are you doing? And I feel as though you're going to cut to the chase and tell me how things are in your life. You've got a captive audience in me that, you know, I, I want to know what's going on. I want to know the juice of what's going on in your life, what's working and what's not working and what things are going great and what things are, you know, you're really struggling with. And, you know, to provide that I have that experience of, of being told the truth, then I feel I'm closer to the source of intimacy. And I, you know, I'm fueled by that as well as I like to invest my energy into that. You know? Yeah, we really have that in common. This was actually a couple months ago on New Year's Eve. Uh, Brandon Hawk, who's been on the podcast, asked me a question that gave me a distinction I never realized I even had before. He asked if I was socially driven or community driven. Because as you know, I'm not a shy person. I'm quite outgoing. And I had never thought about before I've mm. never loved like big <clears throat> events, big parties. When I go to these things, why am I going? It's to connect with the handful of people that I know yeah. I'm going to get to drop in and go deep with. Yes. So uh, yeah. what a cool distinction. So for anyone listening, if you've ever wondered why you hate parties but maybe love people and it's confusing, now you know. Maybe. So you mentioned earlier as well uh, that you really do your best to navigate all the amazing things that happen and all of the not so amazing things that happen. Mm. How do you do that? It's a big fat question. Take it wherever you want. <clears throat> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a few layers to that. Look, I think in, in any endeavor that's worth doing and in any endeavor where there's an opportunity to, to sustain the investment in that endeavor over an extended period of time, a vocation, uh, a, a career in some field, some entrepreneurial endeavor, it doesn't really matter what it is. I think there are two domains that get collapsed. To me, there is this one domain of the endeavor or the subject matter. But if you're going to sustain uh, an investment into some subject matter over an extended period of time, then really what that means is you're about to enter into a long-term relationship. And I'm of the view that if, you're, if you have an endeavor that's sustained over a long period of time, then I think it's really important to learn how to separate those two domains. And for the most part, I believe that they're collapsed. And I think that there's great value in separating them and understanding, okay, it serves me to understand the, the idiosyncrasies and the characteristics and the nature and the challenges of the endeavor. But if I'm, uh, I'm going to sustain this over a period of time, then I really need to get clear of what are the distinctions and characteristics and idiosyncrasies of long-term relationships. Now, I'm of the view that every long-term relationship, no matter what the field of endeavor, all long-term relationships look the same way. And there's six components, as I see it. Three of them are what I would call quantitative, relating to quantity. Three of them are what I would call qualitative, relating to quality. And so I'm going to talk in terms of concepts, just because I think it can be a little bit easier. Yeah. But essentially what I mean, if I'm talking about, about the, the quantity I'm talking about, well, let's actually, firstly, let me just talk about the quality. So I'm just talking about peaks, plateaus, valleys, you know, good times, okay times, not so good, you know, good times, right? So that, that would be the quality, uh, qualitative uh, components. Quantitative, brief, sustained, or prolonged periods of time. So I'm going to suggest that in every long-term relationship, regardless of the field of endeavor, all long-term relationships have some combination of peaks or plateaus or valleys, either in a brief or a sustained or a prolonged period of time. And that's normal. In fact, you can't have a long-term relationship without having those components. All of them have it. So even though your version of it might be different than mine, might be different than somebody else's, all long-term relationships have those six components. And so it ends up looking a little bit like the stock market graph. You know, things are really improving and then they're okay and then, oh, not so great. But then, <laughs> you know, but then hey, things are really awesome. Oh, but no, oh my God, is really, they're really crappy today and that can be going on for a while. 
you know, ultimately we would hope that they're all heading in an upwards trajectory. Mm-hmm. I think everyone wants a successful experience in a, in a long-term endeavour. You know, that would be an ideal scenario. But when we, when we take that long-term endeavour and put it under the microscope, we can see that all of them must have peaks and plateaus and valleys. And they also must have those for either a brief or sustained or prolonged period of time. Now, here's where people get into trouble, that if you don't understand that, if you've got that, that relational aspect collapsed in, into the endeavour domain and you haven't separated them, if you're in a, in a plateau or a valley, the automatic, the automaticity of being human will, will have you think something is wrong. But no, not if you understand that this is a long-term relationship because all long-term relationships require that you have that because the value of these things is not so much in learning how to surf waves and the peaks of the, of the good times. It's the opportunity to discover who do I need to be, who do I need to become in order to navigate my way through the plateaus and the valleys because that's where the real strength and the real character and the real opportunity to grow and develop and, de- you know, and cause the stamina that's needed because you believe that it's worth it. So there's, there's the real value. So for what happens for a lot of people is when they come up to the plateau or the valley – they go right to that humanistic something's wrong. And for me, actually, something is very right when that happens. Very right. (sighs) Because, hey, you can't have this successful intimate partner relationship without having the plateau and the valley. And even if it's happening for a prolonged or a sustained period of time, that's good. That's normal. That's appropriate. You must have this time. So... Uh, I, I know I've said it a lot, but it so, it was when you so said, how, how do I navigate that? Well, one of the things is that I understand that, hey, we're dealing with separate domains here. The things that I'm committed to, there, there's a duality to that commitment. It's the endeavor and it's the long-term relationship. And I understand the nature and the idiosyncrasies of long-term relationships because they all have those same six components. Are you with me? I'm super with you and so glad to hear you saying some of these things and also really, really appreciating that we are we are from two different generations because I think a lot of what you just shared is so important for people to remember in the year 2016 when everyone wants everything better, stronger, faster, 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 now, now, now. Yeah. And we're so apt to jump ship the minute something seems a little wonky yeah. or what you've now given us language for when we've entered into a plateau or a valley. And, yeah. and I appreciate how, how many, you said you've been building, developing your craft in your business for the 20 years, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you, and you've technically been in your relationship, if my math serves me, for 36 years, right? We're now 37 here now, 37 yeah. And, so, years. and self-employed for about 35 years. Or so, so you have... I like to sometimes, I call it like zooming out or some altitude, right? On those longer term relationships. Yes. Whereas a lot of a lot of my women who might be in their 20s, 30s or 40s might not have as much altitude and so might not have the mm. commitment level. And I think commitment is something people really struggle with. So a follow on question to that, in your experience... When, when is it time to break a commitment sometimes? How do you discern, oh, I'm in a peak, I'm in a valley, and, yeah. and the qualitative, this is worth it, and when is it yeah. not? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, there's two answers that come to mind for me with that. Um, the first one is, you know, when I said before about learning how, who you need to become, in the plateaus and the valleys, the the first thing is that I, I'd need to talk about that a little bit. Who do you need to be when you're in those times? Yeah. And uh, I find that uh, around a lot of entrepreneurs, people don't people do really well when things are going great, but when they aren't going so great, uh, there's oftentimes not a lot of room uh, for people to really express what's going on particularly with leaders because oftentimes leaders feel as though they have a responsibility yeah. to always appear like they're up, they're positive, they're moving forward <laughs> and you know, th- there's not a lot of room for an entrepreneur. When an entrepreneur brings an idea into ex- existence, these ideas are our children. Yeah. 
These are our babies. And when something goes wrong, it's, it's traumatic, traumatic. And a lot of entrepreneurs are walking around with PTSD. They don't have anywhere to express the trauma of ideas that aren't, aren't, aren't working. I'm, I'm just and laughing because to call, to say that entrepreneurs have PTSD is like the best description. And it's so true sometimes. So thank you for that. And you know, not everyone listening is an entrepreneur, but, but your ideas and whatever you do, if you're listening, you might work for a company, but you still bring projects in. Like you still deliver things to people. It's still your stuff. This totally applies to that. Keep going. Yeah, well, well, it's the same even in a relationship because so many people, when they're in the excitement and you know the high of a relationship, that that initial chemistry of the relationship, and there's a time when for each of the people in the relationship, it's like I want to be with you forever. And when the, when that's in question, oftentimes there's a trauma associated yeah. with, with that. And so one of the things that I think that one one has to do in in any time of difficulty in learning who do I need to be in order to traverse this difficulty, I think it's tremendously important to allow yourself to fully experience the upset, fully experience the trauma. And I think you need to be surrounded by people or at least supported by people that aren't expecting you to be some some way other than fully allowing yourself to express the upset and the trauma. One of the practices that I like to do, uh, I've had lots of things go wrong, like <laughs> really, really, really wrong, <laughs> lots of breakdowns. And I like to do this thing that I, I call prescribe the symptoms. It's like, okay, I'm questioning, things aren't going great. Should I be doing what I'm doing? Am I meant to be doing this? Is this the right thing to do? I've got a certain amount of upset about it. What I like to do is I like to really let, like prescribe the upset as I'm going to take the upset on as medicine. So I'm willing to go home and get into bed and pull the duvet over my head and just run and hide from the world and sit in the crappiness of it. And if I feel upset, I'm willing to express that and let myself sit in that upset and fully experience it. Particularly hiding is a good I think it's a great thing to do because invariably what happens for me, at some point in time, it's like, this is sort of boring. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really think I would want this. No, I don't, I don't want to really run from this. And I, I find myself invariably asking this question of, is this the hill I want to die on? Oh. It's like... People look at me and it's like, it doesn't matter what the obstacle is. It's like I get up and I move forward. It doesn't matter when I'm hit down. I get up and get back in the ring. But then when things are really bad and I, want to, and I feel like I really need to wallow in that and I think it's important to, I get to that place where I can freely ask myself the question, when I look back on this, for all that I stayed committed to, for every issue that I worked my way through, for every obstacle that I got over, for every hurdle that I transcended, do I want to look back and say, no, this was the event where I finally gave up. This is the event where I let go of my commitment. And I've never come up against the one where I've been able to say yes. In every instance, it's like, no. No, it's sort of not. And I find that in that place, I rediscover the power of the freedom of choice. And I rediscover that whilst the circumstances might be tough, well, I've got to allow for that because that's the nature of peaks, plateaus and valleys for yeah. brief, sustained, prolonged periods of time. And ultimately, in that place, when I fully let myself experience the symptoms of all of that and really bring them on and really wallow in them, I find that I can make a more clear choice of, no, um, this is not the hill I want to die on. And it energizes and fuels my commitments, and my determination and the discipline to proceed by choice. If you had to guess, how long do those self, like the voluntary periods of hiding usually last? Well, not long if you allow them, you allow one, if you allow yourself to fully experience them. Yeah. The problem is, is that if you resist them, they, yeah. they just keep hanging around. That's what right. you resist persists. Yeah, it's so true. Um, and so have the experience. Embrace the experience. Allow yourself to have the experience. Really get into it. If you're going to be upset, really get upset. If you want to cry, cry your heart out. Yeah. 
like yeah. fully experience the upset. Let, let yourself have the upset and then get to that place where you want to make a choice. Now, you asked before about how do you know when to give up in a commitment? First yeah. of all, am I saying too much? I know. Oh, I, I okay. don't know how to give no, short answers. No, you're so great. Steve, I love- Steve Sims is great at short answers. Ah! <laughs> no, you're so great. <laughs> I, just, I just want to pause for yeah. people listening. This is not the first time this has come up, but maybe it can land differently because of your way of saying it for anyone. And I asked that question on purpose. I did this by accident in 2013 when I went through my last breakup. I decided for the first time ever that I was going to do exactly what you said. I sat in it. I sat in it. And I fully felt all of it. And I, I, was, I was through that faster and with more clarity than yeah. any traumatic experience I'd ever had before in my life. And, yeah. and people, again, because of like kind of our culture right now, Wanted a faster, stronger, better, now, now, now. I can do this. I'm tough. And we compartmentalize things. It just comes back later. So I just, I just want to overemphasize the point that to the best of your ability, when you have something, to just feel it. You know, show up if you have to go to work. Show up if you have to be with your kids. But mm. do not deny that fully felt experience. It is okay. And thank you yeah. for putting it in such a beautiful way. So yes, the other the other side of that question. Go and, ahead. And look, too, Elizabeth, you do that so well because, as I've said to you and others, that you you know you are uh, a master uh, in the art and act of embodiment. Thank you. And yeah, and uh, how to be in your body and how to have the you know that, that feeling, that visceral connection of experience to the, to your physiology. You do that uniquely, and uh, you're. Uh, you're, I know that you're a mentor for a lot of people in, in that you. area, so thank you for that. Appreciate that. So the, mm, the, the question about when is it okay to give up? And yeah, commit, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, so we could be talking about a business endeavor, an entrepreneurial endeavor, a, a career commitment, a relationship, uh, you know, for heaven's sake. Um, so firstly, I don't have any advice per se. Um, you know, in fact, my, my best advice often is to not listen to anybody's advice. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> good advice. Having said that, here's the thing that I think about it. I think that anybody listening or watching this podcast would know that there are times in their life where they just know what they have to do. They just know. And I think that when we get to that place where we know what to do, there's a certain certainty about our, our actions because we just know. We're at that stage where we know what to do. Uh, and I think that that is the, the, the best guide, that if you can develop the ability and the subtlety that's needed to listen long enough and quietly enough to what is true for you, if you're uncertain about a commitment, then you are at the stage yet where you don't yet know. So you don't need to act. Yes. Why don't you need to act? Because you don't yet know. Because I promise you, when you know, you will know. And that could be in a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. And it's not about knowing and not acting. It's about, no, it's about listening quietly long enough to, until you intuitively, instinctively, it's like, no, I'm clear. And we know when we're clear because we know it. It's, it's clear to us. It, there's a, a quality that is unique to the knowing that is quite separate from just listening to the, to the, the psychology of being advised, getting input. Oftentimes it's like, should I act because I respect this person? Should I act because they generally know, you know what to do? Should I act because there's some implied expectation? None of that, not all of that is trumped by the certainty of, of what's true for you. My, what I'd suggest is listen, just listen and trust that you'll know. And if you get to that pl place where you know that this isn't right for me, that's when to act. Again, so great. And I think if there's an underarching theme here, it's like the art of patience mm -hmm. and applied in all of the ways that you've described. Because again, I get a lot of women 
who are a little bit stuck or ambivalent about a variety of things, often relationships. Do I stay or, to, or do I go? I've heard, yes. I've, I've recommended this book, yes. Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay, to tons and tons of people to mm -hmm. ask some questions. And even so, sometimes people don't know. And I love this urging that you're giving right now. If you don't know, it's not time to act. Mm -hmm. and, and I would love to add to that. And please don't belabor the not knowing. Because <laughs> right. that's, it's, it's just kind of to go back to what you were saying before. Just like sit with, I don't know. And that's okay. You can yeah. just, you know, move forward in your life and you will eventually know. And it will, yeah. like, you will be fine. So um, I'm super curious. Some, oh, go ahead. And sometimes the, the, uh, the, the belief that I need to know or right. that I should know will right. be the very thing that gets in the way. Yes, Because yes. I said before, the part of it, that art, the artistry is listening quietly enough mm -hmm. and, and long enough. It, this is a quiet act. Uh, that has to uh, operate uh, submerged. It's it's below the chatter of all of the of the, the you know the mental going back and forth. This is a intuitive and instinctive thing. And you're yeah. not everyone. Yeah, everyone. And, man, and I'll share something with you that I realized recently. Um, it's it's not a mistake. It's just something that you can only learn by doing it. In my book, I created this yes no truth practice. And, you know, what you said earlier, I have done a lot of work on myself to be quite embodied and to be connected to my intuition. So I created a practice that works for me. <laughs> and I'm getting a lot of feedback from people that it's not working for them. And I realized I left out this whole part of if you're not getting a hit, that's your answer. Not now. Not right now. So I literally, I, I have to redo that practice, that video to yeah. let people know if you're getting like a blank response, that's the response. You just don't know yeah. yet. And that's an okay yeah. place to be. So yeah. um, as someone who advocates for fully feeling emotions and experiences, this is a, is a great question. Often when I have men on, uh, the women will share it with the men in their lives. Any advice you have, and again, from your perspective, because you're only, you know, you're you, you can't speak for anyone else. When your wife or when are any of your children daughters? You're my youngest. I have three children. My daughter's 28. Cool. So you have a 28-year-old daughter, and I would imagine you have female employees and just other women in your life, right? Yeah, mostly female. I'm around mostly. Great. So as a man, how, how do you be with the emotions of women? A lot of men struggle with that. They shut down. They don't know how to respond. They don't know if they should fix, jump in, stay away. How do you personally handle the emotions of women? Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to give you as direct an answer as, uh, as yeah. I'm capable of here. Great. Uh, I, I don't know. To me, there's nothing to contend with. I mean, um, I... I have um, in my organization, uh, all in all, there's about, in total, there's around, you know, 800 people and about 750 of them are women. And uh, for the most part, uh, I've only ever had, I've always employed a majority women in my, my businesses. And uh, I find women to be awesome, straight, direct. And uh, I, I, I've never found that I've had to deal with women. I just find women fantastic to be around and honest and way more at ease and way more comfortable in being powerful when they're in an environment where they don't feel as though anyone is in the way of them being themselves. Ooh, so I think there was a built-in answer right there. Right. When they're in an environment where they don't feel like anyone is in the way of them being themselves. That's right. And so this is great, man or woman listening, in any situation that feels emotionally challenging, to create that safety where people really feel like they can be themselves. Do you have any thoughts on how to do that? Mm. You might not. You know what I find sometimes? Some people do things so naturally they literally couldn't explain it to you in steps. <laughs> that might be a thing for you here. Well, I, um, uh, 
I talk to the people that I who who work for me. I uh, I'm genuinely interested and concerned. I I want uh, I'm absolutely conscious of the fact that in, when people are working for me, they're investing their lives in uh, into a project that's supporting the fulfilment of uh, of a bigger picture and a vision. And I think that that for me, if the truth be known, truthfully, I I work for. Uh, the people on my team, not the other way around. And uh, the women who I'm around are really capable people and uh, they're capable in areas that exceed my capabilities uh, in those areas and, heck, how would I be any other way other than appreciative and acknowledging? Uh, I just It wouldn't seem natural or organic to me to be any other way than just allowing for that and supporting that and contributing to that and and then how do I find ways to acknowledge that coming from devout generosity what are some ways that you would that you acknowledge your people in in your personal or professional life uh, well I, I like to acknowledge people all the time sometimes acknowledgement can be inclusive I, I mean we eat out a lot I want to make sure that every person who comes to my table to serve me, I'm being served by someone. Like that's a privilege. What an honor to be served by someone. And so if you're coming to my table, I want to know your name. I want to know about you. I want you to experience being appreciated. I want to be thankful. I want, I want you to feel as though you are included in the, the fun and the awesomeness and the fabulousness of the experience. I want everyone to experience that. I want to make sure that if I'm going to the bank and you're the person behind the counter, I want to thank you for being of service to me. I'm, I like to develop the practice of being appreciative, profound appreciation. I also want to do that by developing the practice of politeness and kindness and, 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 and being well-mannered and being thoughtful and gracious and grateful. And It's so much easier. It takes so little energy. It takes so much more energy to be anything less than that, in my opinion. Yeah. You know why I think it takes more energy too? Because the way the world responds to you when you're appreciative, when you're generous, when you're kind, when you're thoughtful, is like it just the world just wants to give to you. And when you're not, the world does not. Like people yeah. people don't exactly. want to help you. People yeah. don't want to listen to you. People yeah. like don't actually want to acknowledge you. So actually like the time and the effort mm. that you might have to contend with like climbing hills when you are not kind, thoughtful, appreciative, uh, you know, there is there is a, an opportunity cost there, I think. Yeah. Um, I called, this was months ago, I had to call the IRS for something. I was yes. on hold for 59 minutes. Yes. When the guy answered the phone, yes. I was so excited. He finally answered the phone. I don't remember what his name was many months later, but I remember I, my reaction was, oh, you're here. I'm so excited you answered. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy Thank was for doing floored. That. He could yes. not have been more helpful. He gave me yeah. a couple insider tips on how to handle yeah. a situation because he's like, man, like, no one's ever happy to talk to us. And I'm like, I'm so happy. I wouldn't wait 59 minutes if I didn't want to get my problem solved. Yeah, that is great. <laughs> it, was, That's great. it was funny, but I, I do remember thinking that way, that like this person probably gets rude response 95% mm. of the time. You never know. Yep. So yep. I've started doing this for fun towards the end of the show, are these rapid fire random questions. Okay. And it's, it's also for a little bit of balance because we tend to go okay. pretty deep in the episodes. So we, we <laughs> maybe, maybe not lighten it up at the end a little bit. So tell okay. me okay. what's like, what are any, any, uh, any indulgences? Like if, if it's, if it's food, if it's a TV oh, yeah. show, if it's something like that, what do you do for, yeah. for that well, kind of thing? I'm, in the, I'm an addict. So I, I, over, you know, I'm passionate about food. I love, I love the consumption of food. I love the sensory stimulation. I just love things in my mouth. And, <laughs> And I love wine. I just love the feeling, the silkiness and the flavor and the complexity of wine. 
I have a very, very long list of things that I'm not good at, and I have a really short list of a few things that I am good at, and cooking is on that list. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I, I know how to cook, and I'm, I'm a good cook. How'd you learn? Um, at, Just by doing? Have you ever taken I, in Australia, classes? I owned restaurants. Right? We, oh. we owned um, a number of restaurants, had three restaurants. And uh, the very first restaurant that I bought was a French fine dining restaurant. And when I bought that restaurant, part of the contract was that the, the French chef who owned the restaurant was contracted to stay on and privately train me. It was the most incredible experience, getting up early and going to the market and buying with him and coming back and learning all about knife technique and cooking technique and sauces and, I mean, all, all of the aspects that, that created the fundamentals of French cuisine. I had this private coaching experience and I've been passionate about food all my life. Yes. Oh, so a, that's a sensualist an dream. <gasps> <gasps> What's your favorite song to play on the piano? That's probably a, a ridiculous question. No, no, I, 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 I almost exclusively, not entirely, but I almost exclusively just play my own music. Oh, great. Perfect. What, Star. um, that's probably my, that song, that's one of my compositions. Oh, what, um, would... are you reading anything or listening to any books right now? Um, I am, I do not have a book on my playlist or read well i've got a lot of books on my read list i'm not reading any book right now congrats i feel like i want to congratulate you on that i don't know why is there yeah. is there a reason or you're just taking a break yeah for me what happens is that i um i end up having these piles of books uh, uh, that i haven't read and really all they do is they just guilt trip me every time i walk by them <laughs> like you should be reading me you should be reading me why aren't you reading me why aren't you reading me it's like i don't need that in my life <laughs> and i just put them up on the bookshelf and no nope, no, you don't get to occupy that much real estate in my psychology. Sorry. Ah, oh, do you? I, actually, as you're saying that, I'm remembering that that exercise you gave us all a declutter document uh, uh, with the concept that literally everything in your space is having a conversation with yes, you. Yes. Yes. That is that is life changing. The holy trinity space. Um, what? Um, do you watch any TV? Oh, I love TV. I absolutely love t TV. I love Top Chef. I love Project Runway. I like American Idol, though, in more recent years. Mm -mm, I love The Voice. I love uh, documentaries. Pretty much on anything. Cool. What, um, um, yeah. Do you ever watch and Chopped? Foodies. Oh, yeah. I love Chopped. Love Chopped. Love Chopped. Love Chopped. And I love so Chopped Junior. It's awesome. These kids, 10, 12 years of age, and they're so good. My love friend's it. son was on it. There you go. So impressive how someone that young can handle that pressure. That is an enormous And I love the movies. Going to the movies. I love – Hunter and I will have movie marathon weekends. Quite often we'll see four or five movies in a weekend. That's oh, fantastic. no way. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Um, up where you live, do they have any of those, like, luxury theaters with, like, the reclining seats and stuff? No. Oh, man. So, so, yeah. you're, so you're roughing it in a regular movie theater. I'm just kidding. I just, yeah. <laughs> the building. I live in Sacramento. They're building a new cinema. Maybe they'll be there. Maybe they'll be there. But I, I don't do the, uh, you know, the soda and and uh, popcorn thing. No. No. Not your jam. What's the best movie you've seen lately? I would. Spotlight was one of them. Uh, I loved The Big Short. I thought that was really, really compelling movie. Yeah. Yeah. There's two. Awesome. So, Spotlight. is there anything I didn't ask you? that you wish I would have or anything you just feel super compelled to share that you couldn't even hold it in if you wanted to before we sign off? Uh, no. Thank you for being so great. And thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. I know that you have that capacity to communicate and interact with people in a way that allows them to communicate their gems and communicate their perspective and you have the ability to distill the essence of that and frame it in a way that you can contribute that to others and it's really important Elizabeth and I want to express my gratitude and my appreciation for an opportunity to do that and also my thanks to you for your ability to make it available to people in a way that actually works for them so thank you. Oh man you you are welcome and this this has been such a great conversation I always jot down some notes as I'm having them and but as I was listening to you um, I was thinking, oh, man, I'm going to have to re-listen to this one two or three times to really get oh. all the pearls because it was that good. Okay. So, Thank you, so Neil, your music website is simplymusic.com. Do yeah. you have a personal website or brand or anything? No. You're just an, an amazing human living your life doing <laughs> your thing. 
And if someone's lucky, maybe they get to run into you at an event like I did. Well, oh, thank, you thank you so much. We are signing off. Anyone listening, um, as always, come on into the Facebook group. Let us know what you loved. Share up the episode if you thought it was great. Send it to the people you love that you think would dig it. And that's it for today. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Elizabeth. We don't always know why, but when you get that yes or that no or something feels so true and so important to you, to be in the practice of listening to it, even though you don't know why, even though you don't understand, is so, so, so important. So in our culture, we do get attached to understanding why, being able to explain things, knowing the reasons for things, or putting meaning on things. And so again, I I super, super encourage you when it comes to trusting your body to just go with your gut. When you've sat with something and when you know that you feel a very strong yes, no, or something feels true, or there's that pull and your body is screaming the answer at you, just trust it. Just be in the practice of trusting it.